this, but we've got a great audience this morning. We've got a lot of visitors with us. We're very thankful for the presence of each one, and we hope that you'll make it a point to come back and to be with us as often as you can. It's great to have the Williamsons as a part of the family here. It's uh, good that to have them as the congregation continues to grow. God's been good in so many ways, and we are thankful for each step forward that we are, are able to make. But for the presence of each one, got some of the kids that are home to, to be around mom and dad for the weekend, and that's a great thing, too. We're glad to have our most of our crew able to be with us today. And so it's always exciting to be able to spend some time as we worship together and to think about spiritual things. If we go to the book of James, in James chapter 1, we find that James writes a wonderful book of very practical information to help Christians learn how to better serve God. If we were just to kind of scan through the book, you know, he talks in the opening verses, verses 2 through 4 of James chapter 1, about how we can have victory over temptation. That whenever we feel like we're running short of, of knowledge and wisdom, that we can pray to ask for God's help, and that he will help us, and that these adversities that we face are actually going to help us to grow and to, to be stronger. If we go a little bit further in the chapter, verses 5 through 7 a little bit, he talks more about how we can you know, experience the power and the benefits of prayer in taking things to, to God and to realize that we need to be able to ask in faith and nothing we free, and that God will hear us in our petitions to him. Later on in that chapter, verses 21 through 25, he talks about our need to be doers of the word, not just hearers, not folks who just can recite Bible verses, but rather individuals who understand what the verses mean, and we actually take that instruction and do it. We put it to use in our everyday lives. In verse 26, he talks about the idea if we want to really serve God like we need to, we also need to bridle the tongue. That we're going to have to watch what we say and how we say it. And that we try to say those things that are uplifting. That we give the, the instruction that needs to be given. That we are just very careful about the things that come out of our mouth. And this morning for just a few minutes, since this is Father's Day. And it is a happy Father's Day wish that we send to, to all of the dads in the, in the audience. I want to focus a little bit on verse 27 of James chapter 1. He said, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. As he's been talking throughout the book so far about what individual Christians need to focus upon doing, he helps us here to understand some things about the practice of pure religion that which is good and righteous in the sight of God. And he mentions a couple of things here. One of these is visiting the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and he also talks about our need to stay unspotted from the world, to rise above sin and to not commit those things that are wrong in the sight of God. I want to talk a little bit about this concept of visiting the fatherless. You know, whenever we talk about pure religion here, we see it being a vital component. On the one hand, he talks about benevolence in our disposition toward the, the fatherless and the widows, and then he also talks about our need to pay some attention to our behavior and the application of those spiritual things in keeping ourselves unspotted from the world. But whenever we start talking about this issue of fatherlessness, it is indeed a big issue to consider. There's a lot to it, and many times it doesn't get, shall we say, the press that it deserves. To help those who truly are in need of a father or a father figure. Now, there are many folks who don't relate well to the verses in Scripture that talk about God being our father. A God that's always there. A God that provides for us. A God that cares for us. A God that loves us. Because we've never had that model in our own life. We've not been blessed with 
the kind of father that exemplified any of those virtues. Now, many of us have been very blessed in having those role models to help us throughout our lives. But there is a tremendous number of people who do not have that advantage. And sometimes I think we just take it for granted that, that guys should just grow up knowing what to do and how to behave themselves and what is showing respect and, and how to do this or how to do They didn't have anyone to fill in that gap and that void in their lives. And as a result of that, there are many things that they don't pick up on as quickly as maybe others would. In a recent uh, study, I think it's back in 2016, in looking at statistics on fatherless children in America, it said as many as 25% of children in the United States live in households with a mother alone. In other words, they are in the situation of not having a father figure in the home with all that that brings to the relationship, all that that brings in the instruction process. Now, there are many folks today who would say, well, big deal. You know, that that's, you know, uh, yeah, we have a lot of single moms, but, but those kids are going to turn out as good as everybody else. It's all just going to be fine. And my hat is off with great care and concern for single moms who have done the work as best they can in trying to bring up their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. But I think every one of them would be quick to say, it ain't been easy. And there have been a lot of gaps. There have been a lot of pieces of instruction. There's been some things that they maybe didn't understand as to why their sons reacted as they did. Just like oftentimes guys have had an age-old problem trying to figure out what makes a woman tick. The same goes the other direction and trying to figure out how in the world could they pick up on certain things and then most of the time not pick up on other kinds of things. Um, there is a whole spectrum of behaviors and attitudes, intuition and knowledge that needs to be conveyed. And when that information is not successfully conveyed, it manifests itself in a host of problems. If you begin to look at the statistics, it makes the point. 63% of the youth suicides in our nation come from single parent households. 90% of the homeless and runaway youth in our society come from single parent households. 85% of all of the youth with behavior disorders are documented to be coming from homes without a father figure. With 71% of the kids who drop out of high school also are faced with this problem of not having a father figure and the problems that accompany that. 70% of the juveniles that you find incarcerated in some kind of juvenile detention center are individuals dealing with all kinds of rage and other issues that come from not having a father figure's influence. In fact, and in fact, 75% of the children that you find in substance abuse centers have that same heritage. When we start looking at those kinds of statistics, we can easily see something is amiss. There is a component that is missing. And while our society doesn't like to talk about it very much, that doesn't change the facts. Oftentimes in our society at the current time, being a father figure is the subject of scorn and something to be laughed at. If you look at many of the sitcoms, the dad is a total doofus. He doesn't have common sense. He has no sense of purpose. He blunders more than he does anything right. And he is characterized in some caricature form as being totally inept and basically unnecessary. But 
all he was good for was to be a sperm donor to bring in kids into the world, and aside from that, he's very useless. Oftentimes, if you want to talk about the problems in society, automatically the point will go, well, you've got all these guys that are bullies, all these guys that are abusive, all of these guys who don't know how to behave, and suddenly we get blamed for every malfunction under the sun because our genetics made us male. There's a lot of instruction, there is a lot of eye-opening information that is a shock to some people because they just have never really looked at it as being all of that important or all of that critical. But seeing the scope of the problem, seeing just how dramatic the issue is, maybe it should put more focus here on James 1.27 as to what we can do to be helping the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. Let's look at some ideas for a little while this morning. What can we do? Well, these problems are complicated. And there's not going to be one quick and easy fix. You know, sometimes in our society, the notion is that whatever the problem is, just throw money at it, and that'll fix it. And so all you have to do is throw money at education or just throw money in social services and just throw money over to these things. And somehow, magically, issues will be addressed, problems will be fixed. It goes a lot deeper than that. Just because a single mom may be fortunate enough to get a child support check each month, that doesn't remove all of her challenges in trying to rear children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There is a lot more support, there's a lot more teaching, there is a lot more insight that is in dire need. And so the first thing that we need to be aware of is that single moms need support. They need others to be surrounded to surround them that illustrate the fact that they care. There are other individuals who want to help bear burdens as best they can. Over in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, that's what we're challenged to do as Christians. It says, bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. When you are a single parent with multiple children to raise, it can be kind of challenging to get to all the different ball fields when they're playing on different schedules. Some help with that is greatly appreciated. <coughs> And when you've got various kids in various schools with various programs going on, sometimes it's nice to have an extra set of wheels to help in some of the taxi service or to help with some of the other challenges that need to be addressed. And sometimes it's just a word of encouragement that a parent needs to be made to feel that there are other folks who understand this isn't easy. It's not that they're necessarily shopping around for sympathy. But we need to help them understand that we can feel some of their pain. We can't walk in those steps exactly. We can't know all of what those challenges are. But we love them. We're worried about them. We want to help out in any way that we can. And one of the biggest things that we all can do for our young people growing up, whether it's a a household that does not have a father figure or whether it's a family that does have a mom and a dad present. The one thing that all of us need to do is to show an interest in our kids. You know, oftentimes we don't understand how important that is. I've heard people say, well, you know, I, my kids didn't remain faithful to the Lord because they just didn't have any other faithful children around them to keep them interested. Or the church didn't do this, and the church didn't do that. I've been around congregations that were brim full of programs and activities. The congregation where I grew up was very active in that regard. We had a couple of pewfuls of young people number of those young people who remain faithful unto the Lord, I could count on one hand and probably have a finger or two left over. It wasn't about entertainment and 
fun and having a peer group to run with. That helped in some regards, I guess. But I've seen young people who grew up in congregations with no other young people around. But they were doted over by a lot of the members of the congregation. They gave them hugs, showed them love, and expressed their appreciation for the fact that they were at services every time the doors were open. I've seen some of our young people here. There were times when maybe work arrangements or sickness or something was such that mom and dad weren't able to come, but the kids came. They were old enough to drive. Mom and dad trusted them to do it, and they were here. And that needs to be recognized and appreciated. That we're thankful that a younger generation has a degree of spirituality that they want to come to the house of the Lord to have a chance to be with others of a like precious faith who want to know something about what the Bible says and the answers that it can supply with the problems that come up in their life. So our children, whether it's a fatherless household, but especially in that situation, they need to know that they are loved by a community of folks in the congregation that cares about them, loves them, and will make sacrifice and will try to do and to help them in some way as we see the opportunity presenting itself. Another option for the many that are fatherless in this country, there are many who simply have nobody anywhere that seems to care. And so, of course, many of you know that uh, our son and daughter-in-law are in the processes of, of adopting a child. And indeed, that is a viable option. That's what Pharaoh's daughter did when baby Moses was found in the river. He even talked about it in Acts chapter 7 and going down to verse 21. It says that when he was cast out, talking about Moses, that when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. She adopted him, as it were, and offered unto him the benefits that the palace and the royal lifestyle could offer unto him. For many kids, they're not asking for a royal lifestyle. They're just asking for a chance. A preacher friend of mine just is, is in the processes of working out, adopting a girl from Bulgaria right now. And in her situation, she's older. She's about ready to turn 16. And in that country, when that happens, they say, there's the door, good luck to you, and push you out onto the street. And you can just imagine the horrors that befall them with those who want to be prey upon young children. And so they are working to make room in their house for yet another, even though they have several children. They want to try and help out in this situation as best they can. And of course, there's always going to be some who just don't see the value in that. Already they found, as they've shown some pictures of this girl who does not yet know much about the Lord, does not yet know much about American ways, does not know much about the American lifestyle, and they see a picture of how she's grown up in an orphanage setting in Bulgaria, and their comments have to do well. How long is it going to be before you get those piercings off of her? And what can you do to cover up those tattoos? And, 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 and. Well, there's all kinds of problems to deal with. That's what raising children's all about. But give it time. Let the Word of God dwell in her richly. And let's see what changes can come. Over Matthew chapter 18, and going down to verse 5, the Lord said, Whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. You know, we all are the beneficiaries of adoption if we are members of the body of Christ. That's the imagery that the Apostle Paul used over in Ephesians chapter 1. That our coming to the Lord, our being baptized into Christ, our rising to walk as a new creature, allows us to experience in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5 the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. We 
we're welcomed into his spiritual household as we acknowledge him as Lord and Savior. And as we begin to listen to his instructions and benefit from his commands. So the concept is throughout scripture that we need to care for children in whatever capacity possible. Akin to what we said a moment ago, we need to befriend such children in meaningful ways. That's what the Apostle Paul did over in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, as we see him taking a young man under his wing, so to speak. What a preacher Timothy became. And over in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, as he's addressing this epistle to Timothy, he says to Timothy, My dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Paul saw a value in Timothy. He worked very hard to help Timothy be successful in preaching the gospel of Christ. And it was more than just an acquaintance that he met once in a while. He regarded him as a son in the faith. Someone that he had a special affection for. Someone that he would have helped out in any way that he could have. We might see the same story demonstrated in Genesis chapter 11. When we see what Abraham did with his nephew Lot. Abraham's brother Haran died. And it was Abraham who took Lot kind of under his wing and tried to help him out. He wasn't as successful in some respects as maybe we would have liked to have seen. Lot did make a poor choice, moved into Sodom, and we know the difficulties of that choice that he made. But nonetheless, Abraham did the best he could do in trying to help that man, to help him get his feet on the ground, to have a solid family, to be financially secure. He did a lot of things to help Lot. That's what we do one with another. What can we do to help? We may not have all the answers. We don't have perfect insight. We don't always perceive and know. We've got some folks here that just amaze me at their perception. They can spot a problem in its very infancy, know that there is a need, and they quietly connect with that need and help out. And I thank God daily for each one of those silent workers that have that ability to see and to just go ahead and do. They don't have to be begged, they don't have to be cajoled, they don't have to be teased into it. That's just what they want to do. Because they see, know, love, and care about others that are around them. Because we also understand that trying to understand to make right choice making in this life requires that we teach the fatherless, as well as all others around us, about the ways of the Lord. Oftentimes, that instruction rings more true from individuals who have maybe a commonality. There's kind of a, a kinship there. There is a mutual sharing and respect for each other. There are some lessons that a man can teach to a young boy growing up that he doesn't take very well if mom tries to teach the very same lesson. It just doesn't quite ring true. So in dealing with another man who has been down that road, oftentimes that instruction is of tremendous help and reassurance. But all of the instruction needs to be based upon the Word of God. Over in Psalm 119, and going down to about verse 9, he says, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. And David goes on to echo how that's applied to him. He said, With my whole heart have I sought thee, oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. A lot of times, children do not realize the importance of spiritual instruction. Going to church just isn't their fun thing to do. And for a lot of times, they don't 
really tap into the benefits of why they come and what they can learn. But Bible instruction helps us make godly choices. It helps steer us away from choices that we could make that's going to bring tremendous hardship and problem. Let's just take an example. We can talk in here a lot about Bible condemnations against drunkenness and what alcoholism can do to you. And we can talk about it and we can talk about it. But still, that doesn't keep people, even from within the body of Christ, deciding at some point in time, maybe that drink is going to be a fascinating sort of thing. It has a certain allurement to it, and I'm going to dabble in that, and the next thing you know, they wind up dealing with the problems of alcoholism. And one of the first steps to help them on the road to recovery is to realize I've taken a wrong turn. This isn't the lifestyle I should be living. I brought tremendous hardship upon myself and upon others. And oh, by the way, that is what they tried to teach me as a kid growing up. That alcoholism can destroy my life. Somehow those warnings begin to echo a little bit as we try to keep it. In Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 4. Here Solomon says, to give subtly to the simple and subtlety to the simple and to the young man knowledge and discretion. Solomon said that's why he wrote this book. Is to help young folks see and understand some of the hardships in life and to read and to learn rather than to do and to fail. See the warning. See where this will take you. Going from down to verses 7 and 8, he said, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. He said, People are not just talking to hear themselves talk. The instruction that we try to share, the biblical examples that we give, the condemnation of sin that the Bible talks about is all there for a purpose. So that we'll be able to see dangers as they come our way and steer around them. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22. Here the young preacher, or here Paul is talking to the young preacher, Timothy, and says, Flee also youthful lusts. What are those lusts? How can I avoid those things? We need to have some of those conversations to help us make wise life choices. Involved in that teaching, especially with young men, addressing that more poignantly today since it is Father's Day, is to teach men how to be men. One of the endangered species of our day is the American male. He is the one who is supposedly looked at as the source of your all care responsibility, abuse, and oppression in our society. And yet there's qualities that God put in manhood and the leadership that goes with that that need to be defended. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and going down to verse 13, Paul, Paul is talking to the Corinthians says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, and quit you like men. Be strong. Don't be a wimp. Understand what your convictions are and stand for those convictions. And make sure those convictions are right. And as you're trying to live a godly life, there's going to be opposition, there's going to be challenges, and there's going to be discouragements. But you stand fast. You don't give it up. Now, whenever you find out that things are sinful and you've made mistakes, then apologize and correct course. That's what repentance is all about. And we're going to have our share of mistaken notions as well. We're not going to have perfect knowledge in every situation. But we need to understand a little bit of what the Bible is telling us to do. Over in Titus chapter 2, and going down to verse 1, here Paul tells Titus, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Know what your Bible says. 
know how to apply the principles that are there. I'm talking to young men specifically in verse 6. Paul says, get told, Paul tells Titus to teach the young men likewise to exhort to be sober-minded. Grow up. Understand there are important things in life. That you have a goal ahead of you. First and foremost is heaven, but other goals in between as to what you want to do with your life. Give some direction and move in positive steps that way. Don't just go, I don't know. Where are you, where are you going to be five years from now? I don't know. Well, you need to start thinking about it and figuring it out. Because if we choose a wife and then have a family, the last thing the wife and kids need to hear is why we're going to eat today, Dad. I don't know. Come on. We have to get some plans made as to where we're going in this life so that we can fulfill another command we've been given. Over in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 5, and going down to, to verse 8, Paul gives the admonition of Timothy, If any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Us as fathers understand the importance of providing for our family. Sometimes that requires extreme sacrifice. Oftentimes, dads do a lot and are appreciated very little for dealing with the issues that they have put up with. We don't always come in every day talking about all of the cheap shots and criticisms that we received at work that day, or how there were the inferences that we were so incompetent and worthless coming from the mouth of somebody else who's trying to soothe their own ego. We just kind of suck it up and try to come into the house with a different disposition and have a good evening with the rest of the family. And then we go back and face it the next day. Fathers need to be appreciated for what they do. The sacrifices that they make in trying to see to it that their families are cared for. And yes, everything can be abused. We can get all caught up in wild nights and wild living and not be what we need to be. But we need to be provided. There's some more things in this lesson that need to be discussed. And I guess I get kind of passionate about some of these things and, and drag my feet here, and I guess I'll have to finish this one tonight. So you can come back to the second edition, and we'll get the rest of, of what might be included here. But there is a whole lot in helping others be what they need to be, whether it's in our own families or especially to families that are missing a cog in the machine, when there's not a father figure there to help in that regard. In thinking about that, I was watching a movie this week called Courageous, and it talks about the resolve that some fathers make to try and bring up their children better. And there was one fellow whose dad had been a total mess. Dad didn't hang around when he was conceived. He'd never really known his dad. Met him later in life and found out he was a flippant drunk who did not have much care, even though he was looking at his own son that he had begotten. And he had a lot of rage and resentment for a long time until he understood that there was a greater father even than his physical one. And that was his father in heaven. Oftentimes, whenever we've had a rough childhood and don't know much about fathers, we feel a little distant about the need to have the help of a father in heaven. <laughs> but he is there to care and to guide and to show his concern and support. And our importance is listening to what he said. Through Jesus Christ, his son, who died for our sins, we've been given a chance to be forgiven of our shortcomings and failures and how we can turn our lives around so that one day we can have the ultimate reward, heaven, when his life is over. This morning, if there's some steps you need to take to make your life right in the sight of God, and if there's some way we can help you, let us help you. We invite you to come. Let's together we sing. God is God.